It's not often we get a new non-numerical name for a Ferrari. As far as names go, the California was one of the best, and most appropriate, in the business, but the 9-year-old hardtop convertible was beginning to show its age, despite a refresh in 2015. The Ferrari Portofino is here to pick up where the California left off, refining the entry-level Ferrari slot with a new face, engine, and name. We've seen this car already when it debuted earlier this month, but Frankfurt was the first time we saw the new drop top in the flesh. Love it or hate it, the original Ferrari California was a landmark car for Maranello. It ushered in a stunning number of brand firsts, and set a stylistic and technologic standard. Most notably, it was the first Ferrari with a V8 in the front, as well as the first Ferrari with a dual-clutch automatic transmission, a retractable metal roof, multi-link rear suspension, and direct injection. When the refreshed California T made its debut in 2014, it was the first turbocharged Ferrari since the F40, a supercar last sold in 1992. The Portofino isn't nearly as revolutionary as the California, but it's desperately pretty, something that couldn't be said about its predecessor. It's visually similar, but is tighter, lithe, and sports a gloriously reduced rear rump when compared to the big butt California. The Portofino's got quite the handsome profile, especially in the front, where it pulls design influence from the current 812 Superfast, aping the bigger V12 car's front fascia and side cuts. Power still comes from a 3.9-liter twin-turbocharged V8, but output is now up to 591 HP and 561 LBFT of torque, a 38 HP and 4 LBFT improvement. Power is shipped to the rear wheels though a 7-speed dual-clutch transmission hooked up to Ferrari's 3rd Gen E-Div, a setup that returns much improved performance. Thanks to a 162-pound deficit over the older car and a refined, more powerful drivetrain, the Portofino rips from 0 to 60 miles per hour in just 3.5 seconds, and onto a top speed of over 199 mph. It's not as fast as the mid-engine 488 GTS, but still rapid enough to ruin your $300 haircut. It's an entry-level Ferrari, but that doesn't mean it shares market space with the new Honda Civic. Prices begin at around $211,000, and only climb stratospherically from there. Look for landfall in the US around next summer. Aston Martin's last naturally aspirated V12 takes a boisterous bow. Gaydon, England. Press the rectangular glass key into its ignition, a bit like you would have with an old cassette player, and after an initial ascending scale, a singular, gurgling roar erupts as the engine's 12 timpani awake. The 2018 Vanquish S Volante is the last of Aston Martin's cars to use a naturally aspirated V12, and it's going out fashionably loud and tastefully topless. The ultramarine black convertible rogue barrels through England's verdant countryside wreaking elegant havoc with your hairdo amongst the hedgerows. Who cares? Anyone who's looking probably isn't checking out the driver, but what's making that otherworldly commotion? The argument can comfortably be made that the Vanquish S has the best sounding engine in the business. And yes, 
that includes the twin turbo V12 that powers Aston's latest masterpiece, the DB11. There are two gentlemen at Aston Martin whose sole purpose it is to perfectly fine tune every engine note. Bravo, lads. The Vanquish S Volante is the last of the old guard Aston, the last to be underpinned by the brand's formerly ubiquitous VH platform, and the last with the brand's signature, free breathing V12 under its sweeping hood. For the time being, Nothing else matters but the sweet, cacophonous sound of the 12-cylinder symphony resonating in the volante with the top down, as it's made to be driven. According to Andy Palmer, Aston Martin's president and CEO, the V12 will always be an integral part of the brand's DNA, but US emissions regulations are forcing the hand of the British car company. The future Vanquish will be powered by a version of the DB11 SV12 and is unlikely to have the same raucous gurgle. Relish it while you can, the fat lady just started singing. The Vanquish S Volante saddles 595 horses in that glorious 6.0 liter engine. When 0 to 60 comes in a hasty 3.5 seconds, one doesn't doubt the livestock underhood. A revised aero package for the Vanquish S includes a reimagined splitter designed to keep the front end hugging winding country roads and an updated rear diffuser that helps allay drag, though it is a drop top so all bets are off if you're looking for the performance of a coupe. Revisions to the grill and front intakes help enhance cooling, while quad exhausts make an assertive statement and further heighten the acoustic authority of the S. If it were possible to swim in a sound, this is a plunge in the Caribbean. While supremely powerful, the Vanquish S Volante would never be so rude as to make you feel like it's driving you. The throttle response is finely measured and immediate imperative while sharing with an oncoming semi-truck what in America would be narrower than a one-way road. The automatic transmission's eight speeds are well-bred and show up punctually, delivering a perfect amount of the car's available 485 pound-feet of torque at both ends of the range. The steering isn't sports car hyper-responsive, but Aston isn't going for that with this Tony GT. Separate sport modes are available for both the engine tune and the suspension, so damping can be adjusted independently for the appropriate situation. During the drive, I keep the Vanquish S in sport mode. That lovely, long first gear crescendo rowdily pours into the amphitheater-esque cabin. The suspension I keep in normal for added support while traversing the less maintained English countryside's potholes and ditches. More muscular in design than in previous model years, this car is a brute in a suit, says Vanquish S head designer Miles Nurnberger. Its proportions are elegant and assertive and it stands at once athletic and graceful. The bridge of wear leather seats are predictably comfortable and supportive, and effectively heat or cool your bum accordingly. Aston's push-button shifter that resides atop the center stack keeps the space pleasingly streamlined, but takes some getting used to operating without looking directly at it, especially on left-hand drive cars where the D button is furthest from the driver. Dot look more closely under the tailored vest, though, and there are some inevitable signs of age. The speedometer is near impossible to read and there is no indicated red line, so using the paddle shifters is effectively done by ear. The NAV system is a quirky retractable thing that, with the top down, requires the shouty map lady to bark directions at you, because the screen isn't visible in dappled sunshine. At least the Vanquish S is hip enough to have a place for your cell phone, and a USB charger hides discreetly in the center console. However, keep calm and carry on, because the DB11 has effectively seen the peccadillos fixed, 
and thusly fixed is everything that follows. As expected, the interior is festooned with world-class materials, and is eminently customizable to every taste, even questionable ones. The coachworks are in full peacock mode when the volante's top is down. Thankfully that same canvas top closes on the fly at speeds less than 30 miles per hour in the likely event of a sudden English summer downpour. Even with the top up, this chap's a stunner, which is what you'd hope with a starting price of $312,950 for the volante. First deliveries for us Yanks are imminent. Yeehaw! Customers in the US, Aston's largest market, are used to heading to a dealer and driving away in their car. It takes more than 200 hours to build an Aston Martin, 50 of those hours for the paint job alone. The anticipation of a handmade car being a bonus is something Aston Martin executives must sell in order to help secure their future. Will Aston's new spokespeople, Tom Brady, and Serena Williams, be marketing silver bullets? Perhaps. At least the lasting value of the brand is palpable. Of the 80,000 plus Aston's already built in its storied history, some 95% of those are still in existence according to the car maker, a testament to their hand craftsmanship and desirability. But only time will tell if its current ambitious path will lead to stable success for a brand that's seen seven bankruptcies since its inception. Cross those bespoke gloved fingers. One thing's for sure, the 104-year-old British manufacturer isn't genteelly sipping tea at a garden party. Next year it wades into uncharted waters with the DBX luxury SUV, with production taking place just outside of Cardiff, Wales, in three airplane hangars that previously housed the hulking Hercules aircraft. A new Vantage is slated to arrive at around the same time as the DBX. A low-volume repeat of the new Vanquish and DB11, and a reincarnation of the Lagonda brand are also on Aston's busy agenda. But for the time being, for just a bit longer, revel in what was. Let the wind blow through your hair. Listen with sonorous delight to the Vanquish S. Volante's furious melody, for this rakish nobleman is deserving of its final open-aired encore, and Aston Martin shouldn't have done it any other way. Once more with an elegant vengeance, Maestro. Long remain the struggle of many a yacht owner once you step off the boat, how do you show the poor, less fortunate onlookers that you own a multi-million dollar ocean cruiser? Once you're back on Monaco streets, 
you're just another schlub with a Ferrari. Worry not, Captain Bentley's bespoke Mulliner division has stepped up with a new yacht-themed Continental GT convertible to match your vessel. It's called the Galene Edition, named for the Greek goddess of calm seas. It certainly looks serene, especially with the standard glacier white paint. Contrasting the pearl paint is a handsome stripe of sequin blue that runs down the length of the lower body, mixing well with the dark blue cloth top. At all four corners, polished 21-inch propeller wheels round out the design. Inside, each galleon arrives with light-colored white and taupe seating surfaces, contrasted with caramel stitching and a bluish-gray dash with caramel inserts. Mulliner created a special open pour wood for the galleon, a new pinstripe walnut trim that evokes a deck design found on yachts. If this isn't aquatic enough, you can commission a special super yacht illustration by Jaume Villardel on the passenger side fascia panel. Despite representing excess and wealth, each galleon is powered by the Audi sourced 4.0 liter twin turbo V8 and not the massive 6.0 liter W12. Power is still impressive, with 500 HP and 487 LBFT of torque on tap. Just 30 galleon additions will be made, so make a sea to port call to your Bentley concierge of choice before they're all snapped up. It's part to turn every season into convertible season. Mont Blanc. France. Punta Helbroner is a marvel of modern construction perched on a craggy peak in the Italian Alps more than 11,000 feet above sea level. Accessible only after taking two silent rotating gondolas from the quaint alpine village of Cormayeur, the two-year-old metal and glass structure houses a bistro, a rare crystal exhibition, and a circular observation deck roughly 45 feet in diameter providing visitors with up-close views of Mont Blanc on one side, and, on a clear day, the Matterhorn on the other. And the day I visited, it also provided one primo parking spot for a 2018 Mercedes-Benz E-Class convertible. While Mercedes 4 MATIC all-wheel drive system is available on the all-new W213 generation E-Class Cabriolet, it would take more than that to get such a car up to Punta Helbroner, which looks like the Millennium Falcon after getting impaled on an Alp. Hence, Mercedes-Benz hoisted the car up there via helicopter. Yes. It's unnatural to see a car in a place like that and yes, it's pretty cool, and yes, it's a stupid PR stunt, and yes, it's a PR stunt that worked cause I'm telling you about it. And it was one hiluva. But I knew most of that long before the trek to Europe's nosebleed section, both from the coverage of the car's debut at this year's Geneva Motor Show as well as a preview ride in lightly camouflaged prototypes in Arizona during the winter. What I came to Europe to find out, then, was how it drives, and what, if any, compromises one might have to make to enjoy it. And I wasn't going to learn any of that from an observation deck in the sky, so down I went. If my experiences with the C and S class convertibles provided any insight, the W213 E class Cabriolet would drive pretty much exactly like its hardtop sibling. And guess what? It does. As with the coupe, the Cabrio is available in the US only as an E400 at this point powered by Mercedes Bitterbacharge 3.0 liter V6 with 329 horsepower and 354 pound feet of torque, with a 9 speed automatic transmission managing the ratios. You won't be dropping the top just to hear the ho hum exhaust note, that's for sure, but it's generally quiet, 
relaxed demeanor is well matched to the cabriolet's raison d'etre as a high-class boulevardier. For those seeking more grunt, rumor has it that an AMG-badged version is set to. To that end, the E-Class Cabriolet facilitated a touring experience of the Swiss Alps that I can only describe as idyllic. The temperatures on my drive at times reached well into the 90s, at which point I had cool air blasting through the jet-like air registers and the front seat coolers at their max setting. Engage the optional air cap wind deflectors, one thin, full width screen rising a couple of inches up from the windshield header and another, taller screen rising from behind the rear head rests, and the E-Class Cabrito keeps a respectable amount of the conditioned air in the cabin in addition to minimizing hair tousle, provided you keep the side windows raised. With air cap raised and the windows down, the cabin remains reasonably calm and conversation friendly, though the climate control is rather less effective. All that said, between the body's high belt line and the steep windshield angle, the cabin remains relatively tranquil at highway speeds even with all windows and screens tucked away, when the car really looks its best. Additionally, when I parked my car in the sun to grab a cappuccino and sample some local cheese, because Switzerland, heat reflecting leather upholstery saved my If you've been angling to pick up a two-door S-Class but saw the updated sedan make its debut in April at the Shanghai Auto Show and decided to hold out until Mercedes released the facelift 2018 models, you're now clear to exhale though don't reach for the checkbook quite yet. While the 2018 Mercedes-Benz S-Class Coupe and Cabriolet are coming to the 2017 Frankfurt Auto Show later this month, they won't be reaching dealers until the middle of next year. Both two doors will be available in three flavors, S560, S63, and S65, with the latter two obviously being AMG models. The S560 replaces the S550 in the lineup and uses a 4.0-liter twin-turbo V8 instead of the previous 4.7-liter. Despite the reduction in displacement, power increases by 14 HP to 463, while torque is unchanged at 516 lb-ft. Distribution duties remain assigned to a 9-speed automatic, which is mated to Benz's 4MATIC all-wheel drive system in the coupe, but sends power only to the rear wheels in the convertible. The S63 also sees its engine downsized, the 2017 S5.5 liter V8 making way for the handcrafted AMG version of 4.0 liter, which is also found in the 2018 E63 sedan and wagon. And again, power goes up instead of down, increasing from 557 HP to 603, while torque again remains unchanged, here sitting at 664 lb-ft. The 2017 S7 speed auto makes way for AMG's new 9-speed multi-clutch automatic, but unlike the S560 S, both S63 two doors come with 4 MATIC all-wheel drive. As for the S65, the beast retains its 6.0-liter twin-turbo V12, its output unchanged at 612 HP and 738 lb-ft of torque. It's still rooted directly to the rear wheels by a 7-speed automatic. Despite the S65S power advantage, it's 0.6 seconds slower to 60 miles per hour than the S63, which hits the mark in a claimed 3.4 seconds. Of course, ultimate performance stopped being the reason why people choose the 12-cylinder long ago. Aside from the powertrain shuffle, the 2018 S-Class Coupe and Convertible don't differ much from the 2017 versions. Cosmetic updates are fairly minor, regardless of variant. All six offerings get new front and rear bumpers, new headlights, and OLED tail lights. The AMGs also get the new Panamericana grille from the AMG GT, which gives the models a more aggressive look but doesn't entirely work with the lines of the body, though the presentation may work better in the metal. Inside, 
there's a new three-spoke steering wheel and a new version of the common infotainment system with twin 12.3 inch screens one for the digital gauge cluster and one for everything else, same as the 2018 E63. The asymmetrical design looks strange in photos, as is the case with the grille, the presentation may work better in the leather and plastic, but it doesn't appear that Benz updated the design of the trim piece under the screen that houses the center vents to match. Additionally, there are three new interior trims and a new black and red upholstery choice. The extensive portfolio of luxury and safety features expected in an S Class that is, all of them doesn't change. Massage seats, adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, Android Auto slash Apple CarPlay, etc., are all on the table. About the only thing the 2018 S Class won't do is pick your music for you and drive itself and at least one of those is almost certain to be rectified in the next few years. With nearly a year to go before the fixed roof two-door and its soft top counterpart arrive in showrooms, Mercedes didn't announce pricing. The outgoing S-Class Coupe started at $123,675 for the S550, $165,675 for the S63, and $237,175 for the S65, while the 2017 S-Class Cabriolet started at $132,325 for the S550, $177,325 for the S63, and $248,825 for the S65. There's no reason to expect a significant departure for 2018 given the limited changes.